And welcome to Weekend Bible Study. I'm your teacher, Elder Philip Smith, and we're just so happy to be able to bring you another lesson in God's Word. Realizing, as I say on each week, that the more the Word of God you know, the easier it is to live this life, and the more profitable you are to the Father. We just want to let you know that we're coming to you from the Full Gospel Holy Temple Church of Dallas, Texas, where our pastor is the Apostle Herman L. Murray, Jr., our First Lady is Evangelist Daniel Murray, and our founding first mother is Evangelist Dr. Shirley Murray. We're just so happy to be with you again today, and, and I really hope that you are enjoying these lessons. We just thank God for this opportunity. We really do. Now, on last week, we talked about Samson and his encounters with the Philistines. We were getting started with Samson. You know, we laid a foundation last week because Samson was a very unusual judge. As I said on last week, all the other judges, when it came down to delivering Israel, they took armies with them in order to do it. They had to have manpower. Even Gideon, who only had a little bit of manpower, 300 men, but he still had to have some help. Samson, on the other hand, was unique because he was a one-man army. God had so gifted this young man with strength and ability that the Philistines could not stand before them. No matter how many they sent, Samson, he was able to handle it. You know, last week when we were introducing you to Samson, we talked about behavioral patterns. And, and, and I'm going to continue down that road today, if I may, because one of the things we have to understand about Samson as a man and about our God, as I told you, God never does anything without layering his reasons. You know, you're going to see the reason on, on the surface that he did it, but there are always going to be underlying reasons and underlying things that he is trying to accomplish. Um, first thing I want to tell you that Samson was an allegory for the children of Israel. And what I mean by that is he was a living uh, we'll say example of how they acted, how they responded, how they carried themselves. So before we get off into that, let us pray. Father God, in your mighty son Jesus' name, we want to make sure that we give you the honor and the glory before we do anything. We want you to know that we appreciate you for allowing us to go off into your word, and we appreciate your presence giving us understanding. We ask that you would just bless us, Father God, today, that we might be able to understand and that we might be able to utilize what we learn, that we might do a greater work for thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone say amen. Amen. Now, the before stated, Samson was an allegory for the children of Israel. And, and you may say, well, Brother Philip, would you explain that? All right, I will. As I said, the children of Israel had a behavioral pattern that they went by from the time they left Egypt. And this is because they were children of promise. They were the promise that God gave to Abraham. They were the children of the promise. And as such, they were children of privilege. See, the thing about privilege is that it is given to you freely, but not necessarily because you earned it. You know, the reasoning for it is not warranted by things that you yourself have done, but it's done by your progeny, by who you are related to. And because they were the descendants of Abraham, the children of Israel were given privileges. When they came into the promised land, God fought with them in every battle so that they were victorious. When Samson was first uh, 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 introduced to us, God introduced it to his father and his mother first before he was even born, but he let them know that he was going to be a special child. As I said, he was a Nazarite from birth, so that meant he was a child of privilege. Now, the thing about being a child of privilege is when you are given things that you did not earn, you sometimes get to thinking, number one, that you are greater than what you are. You're more special. 
And because of this way of thinking, it, it causes us to behave in certain ways. Just like I said, behavioral patterns. The children of Israel behaved a certain way once they got into the land, once they got the cities that they had not built, vineyards that they did not plant, olive yards and all that stuff. They acted a certain way. They acted like they were entitled to all of this. Samson did the same thing. He felt like he was entitled to everything that he got. And his attitude was that if he wanted it, he went and got it. He did not deny himself these things. So, as I said, they were an allegory for each other. God blessed Samson with strength. God used Samson to deliver Israel. God used Samson to deliver himself from the hands of the Philistine. God would empower judges to deliver Israel from their enemies. God empowered them as they came to the promised land with Joshua. So you see what's going on. The problem is that a, 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 an attitude of selfishness comes in at some point because you feel like you're special or more special than anyone else. Now, we have to be careful. Because like I say, a, 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 a lesson in the scripture does not uh, relate unless we make it relatable. You say, well, Brother Philip, what do you mean by making it relatable? Solomon said, there's no new thing under the sun. So the things that Samson and the children of Israel went through, the way that they felt are really no different than the way some of us feel now. Some of us feel so privileged that, as I said on last week, that when we walk into the room, we feel like the whole room is made better just because we showed up. You know, and I say I would love that to be the case, but it should be because you show up with an attitude of gratitude, not because you just showed up and that your, 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 your countenance just brightened everything. It should never be about you. It should always be about God. So I say he was an allegory. If you go right down through it and see how his life played out, selfishness, privilege, arrogance, you see what I'm saying? He was blinded by arrogance and lust, and the fruits of revenge are bitter. Now, why are we talking about this? You remember on last week, we talked about how that Samson's wife had told, had been coerced into giving his enemies the answer to his riddle. And because of this, Samson responded by killing 30 men to give them to take their clothes, to give to the people that he owed the clothes to, okay? Then, because they killed his wife and his father-in-law, after he burned their field, he killed the men. You see what I'm saying? It's just following down a pattern right here. We've been talking about patterns the whole time. James 1, 3, I mean 13 through 15. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Mm -hmm. For God cannot be tempted with evil, mm -hmm. neither tempted he any man. Mm -hmm. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. We're going to hold right there. What, why would I bring that scripture in? Because lust is what was causing Samson to do the things that he was doing. He was being driven by his own desires to satisfy his own lust. And this is the thing that gets us in trouble. Our desires to satisfy our own lust. And when we talk about lust, the first thing that comes to so many people's minds is the lust of the flesh. But lust goes a whole lot more deeper than just the lust of the flesh. Some people lust after Fame. Some people lust after money. Some people lust after prestige. You see, there are so many things that we can desire. Anything that we desire that is not according to God's will is lust. Now, as children do, children want what they want when they want it. <laughs> That's the way a child is. And sometimes we act like a bunch of kids. We want what we want when we want it. Amen. And that's how Samson acted. You know what? If you really look at his life, he had a childlike mentality. He really did. Now, another thing about children, and, and, and you know, I've, I've, I've been a youth minister for 40 years, and one of the things I know about children is they're extremely honest. And when you say, Brother Philip, what do you mean by extremely honest? I mean that they're honest about the way they feel. I'm not saying they won't lie. 
I'm saying they're honest about the way they feel. If they don't like you, they don't like you. If they like you, they like you. There's no pretense with children. But also, children have a very heightened sense of right and wrong, of what is fair and what is unfair. Children are really, really big on that particular subject. Look at Samson. He felt like the way he was treated, he was treated unfairly, and he responded just like a child, a child would. He lashed out. So Samson hadn't grown up. How many of us haven't grown up? How many of us react rather than act? One thing I always taught my children, be an actionary, not a reactionary. What do you mean by that? A reactionary is someone who does something based upon what someone else does without giving thought. That's the key. Because I really, I understand we have to respond, but we should never react. There's a difference. When you respond to something, that means you've thought about it and you plan out how you are going to deal with it. When you react, there is no thought. You just do. Unfortunately, this is where our man Samson was. All right. So he's done all these things. Though Samson was given a great victory against the Philistines and then named judge, he did not learn anything from his experiences with his wife and her people. You know, it, it's a bad thing when you don't learn from bad things. <laughs> if you don't learn from the, uh, 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 the mistakes you make, you're going to repeat them over and over and over again. Uh, let me say this. You can't force something to be right if it's wrong. There's no way you can justify it. Wrong is just wrong. I don't care how you take it apart, put it back together in a different way. If it's wrong, it's just wrong. If it doesn't work, it just doesn't work. I don't care what you do. So if it did not work, then learn from it and make the adjustments that will make it work. Do you think that Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone without having some problems? Actually, uh, uh, when he actually invented it, it was by accident. <laughs> he finally come up with the right combination and he spilled something and he, and he called his man and said, I need you. And the man heard it over the telephone line. I can't remember how many filaments that Thomas Edison went through before he was able to find the right filament that would burn uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the light bulb. I can't remember how many it was, but it was a lot. It wasn't two, it wasn't 10, it wasn't 15, it wasn't 50. But he learned from every mistake. He learned from everyone that failed. And that's the way it was supposed to. But Samson didn't learn anything. That's the problem with Samson. He didn't learn anything. Look, he, he went after someone he should not have had in the first place. He should have married amongst his own people. But because he was a child of privilege, what did he say? Behavioral patterns. He wanted what he wanted. And he went after what he wanted. And he got what he wanted. But just because you get it doesn't mean it's the right thing for you. Many of us have gone after things to our own hurt too often. Amen. And we've learned nothing from it. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to say this, and I mean no disrespect, no harm to anybody. But have you ever known a person who keeps dating the same type of person and keeps getting hurt? What does that tell you? They haven't learned anything. He learned nothing from his experiences with this Philistine and with his wife, who was a Philistine. He should have learned that they could not be trusted, but he didn't. You know why? Because he felt like he was able to deal with any situation. You know, we, we've got to understand that some things are not within our power to deal with. And let me say this too. Some things are not for us to deal with. Don't just grab something and say and interject yourself into it just because you feel like you can handle it. If it's not your trial, did you hear me? If it's not your trial, 
Leave it for the person who God is trying to teach, because that's what the trial is for, for them to learn from it. He did not learn anything from his experiences with his wife and her people. Also, revenge and pride have far-reaching consequences. If you notice, all the things that Samson did, as I told you, like a child, was to get even. <laughs> That's what kids do. I'm going to get even with you. You know, some of us still are that same way in our spirit. I'm going to get even with you. You know, I have a brother, and I was talking to somebody about him the other day. In fact, I was telling him about it. I said, well, we're growing up. My brother did not get even with you. He got hit. <laughs> So he wasn't anybody you really wanted to mess with. Because <laughs> by the time he got finished, he wasn't going to be even with you. He was going to be ahead. But that's the way some of us still think to this day. Look, Paul said, when I was a child, I thought of the child. I understood of the child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. Samson stayed a child far too long. Revenge is never ours. Deuteronomy 32 and 35, sir. To me belong it vengeance and recompense. Mm -hmm. Their foot shall slide in due time. Amen. For the, for the day of their calamity is at hand, uh -huh. and the things that shall come upon them make haste. Look, saints, if someone does you wrong, pray for them. Jesus told us that. Pray for them that despitefully abuse you. You know why? Deuteronomy 32, 35. Their foot shall slide in due time. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord. I will repay. I will recompense. That's God. He owns that. We don't. You know why? Because God is the only one who can treat it fairly. Because he knows all the information. He knows why things happen. Because look, when we're on the outside looking at the situation, we think we understand what's really going on. And I'm going to tell you, we don't. We don't all know all the little nuances, all the little intrigues that went on behind the scene that we missed. You know, we'll look at a situation and say, boy, I, I, I wouldn't have put up with that. I don't know why they should have did this or another. But you don't know what went on. So please don't be so quick to judge. Let the Lord handle it. Somebody did you wrong, you feel like God, uh, that, that it's time for you to respond, you respond with prayer. You never respond with vengeance on your own. He said, I will recompense, I will repay, the foot shall slide in due time. And I'm going to tell you something. You can't do it as well as he can. <laughs> when God handles the situation, trust me, it's handled. You say, well, Brother Philip, we're talking about Samson's final victory. Isn't that the lesson today? Yes, it is. But you got to understand Samson again, like I told you. You got to understand his mindset, why he acted the way he did. And, and let me say something too. Your actions bring about consequences, as I said for, earlier. And those consequences can be very dire. And they can be very hurtful. Samson kept tempting God through his own lusts. We read in James, let no man say that he is tempted of God when he's tempted. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. The thing that, you know what? I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm going to say this anyway. You've got to understand what your weak points are. You've got to understand what the devil can use against you. And what he does, he usually dredges up our past. The things in our past are the things that he used to keep us bound before. And trust me, he does not try to come up with any newfangled ways, as they say, to ensnare you. He'll go to the tried and true methods that have always worked because your personal imp who's been with you since birth knows which buttons to press to get certain reactions from you. And understand this, you were not their first assignment. So they understand the heart of man. But we'll get to that in a little bit. All right. Child of privilege with no restraint. Uh, and let me talk to you parents for a minute. We have to make sure we keep our children grounded. And what I mean by grounded, we got to keep them in reality of who they are. 
you know, all your children are special. They, at least way they should be special to you, okay? All of my children are special to me. But guess what? I know all of my children too. I know their tendencies. When they were growing up, I knew how each one would act. In fact, when my kids went to college, I knew exactly how each child would fare in college. I knew because I knew my children. I was not somebody who was a standoffish father, but neither was I a father who was hands-on all the time. I let my children grow up. My wife and I did that. We let them grow. We encouraged them, but we were there to correct when necessary. And correction didn't always mean uh, a chastisement. Sometimes correction was just talking and pointing out things. Mm -hmm. But when you have a child that has no restraint, when you have a child that has been not given any boundaries, anything can happen, and it's usually something very negative. Proverbs 22 and 6, and then skip to 15. Mm -hmm. We're going to do a little reading today because I want to make these points, and I want you to get it from the Scripture, not from my mouth, but what the Scripture says. What does it say? Proverbs 22 and 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. Mm-hmm. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. If you don't train them, how will they know which way to go? Now, 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. And you will, I, I believe you can testify with me that Samson was very foolish in how he acted. So foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. You cannot, let me say this to you, you can't expect your child to act like an adult and he's five years old. Mm. Eight years old, mm. 12 years old. Mm. They are not miniature adults. Amen. They must be trained. And foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. You know why foolishness is bound in the heart of a child? Because ignorance is bound in the heart of a child. As long as a child is ignorant to a situation, they have the possibility of making the wrong choice. But the rod of correction, and that rod doesn't always mean a, a rod across their back. Sometimes you can discipline them just with your words or by denying things to them, putting them on punishment. You know, I think uh, when my kids were going, they used to call time out or whatever. But you see what I'm saying? There have to be boundaries set. Samson didn't have boundaries set. So Samson was a wild child with a great deal of ability left to his own device. I think the scripture says something about that. A child left to his own devices will be the shame of his mother or something like that. Something like that, yes. So he was basically free to do whatever he wanted. Now, we're getting ready to get off into the lesson, but let's, let's see what happened to Samson after he killed a thousand Philistines and started became the judge over Israel. His ways did not change because he felt like he was greater than any situation that could come against him because the Lord was with him. Please stop trying to hide behind the Lord when you're doing something you don't have any business. Mm -hmm. Do not try to use the Lord to justify your actions. If they don't coincide with what the word said, then that's you. God has nothing to do with it. Let's talk about what Samson did, though. After this, he became a judge, and then he slept with a harlot in Gaza of the of, excuse me, in Gaza of Philistine city. So he had learned his lesson about Philistine women. He just could not stay away from them. So he, he found him another woman in Gaza. And he went down there and he spent some time with her. But the Philistines were looking for a way to get rid of him. So the men of the city lay in wait there to kill him in the morning. When they found out Samson was there, they had, they had plans. They said, oh yeah, we'll just wait and we'll kill him. I don't know if they had an arrow. I, I doubt that they were going to get too close to Samson because they already knew the result of getting within arm's length, arm's length of Samson. But they waited and he awakes at midnight, and then he tears the gates away from the, the wall of the city that sets them on a hill for all the world to see. As I before stated, he was blinded by arrogance, lust, and revenge. Now, arrogance is basically pride. Now, Samson 
realized that they were lying and waiting for him, so he wanted to show them that he was not afraid, number one. Number two, there was nothing they could do about it. He goes to the gates of the city, finds the gates locked. Rather than just busting through the doors and going out, he picks up the entire gate, takes it off the wall, and then sets it on the top of the hill for everybody in the city to see it. Why? Because he wanted to show off. That was what it was all about. He just wanted to show off. Arrogance. You know, we better be careful when we're doing things, and, we, and like I said, and we attribute them to the Lord. Make sure the Lord is in it, whether you're singing, whether you're preaching, whether you're teaching, whatever it is, make sure God is in it and it's not you. Because the minute it becomes you and it starts being God, that's the minute it becomes unfruitful. He was just showing off, putting this thing on the hill for everybody to see. So I'm bad. I'm Samson. There's nothing y'all can do about me. A petulant child. One thing about it, though, as I before stated, even though uh, 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 Samson was this way, and like I told you about us, we need to be careful of the things that are in our past because the devil will try to use those against us. The thing that was our weakness before, he will try to bring that back at us all the time. Now, though Samson did not learn anything from his encounters with the Philistines, the Philistines did. They learned. They got tired of Samson whooping them. They got tired of Samson mocking them. You know, when, when you mock a person, you, you really set a fire within them. And that's what Samson was doing. He was mocking the Philistine. I'm stronger than everybody or anybody you've ever known, and there's nothing you can do about me. See me for who I am. Look at my greatness. My God. But the Philistines were paying attention. They knew that coming at Samson directly was tantamount to suicide and therefore would not work. So they would have to deal with him subtly. They realized that force would not work with Samson. So they decided to switch to craft. You know, some of us wouldn't dare commit some of the, what we would call the major sins. But it's those little sins that get us. It's those things that we feel like are no harm. Those are the things that start tearing down our uh, fortress, so to speak. Those are the things that dig away from our protection. And sometimes it's not sin. Sometimes it's little weights we add, mm -hmm. little activities, little habits mm -hmm. that we pick up that are not godly. We've got to be careful. What does the Bible say? Uh, what is that? Hebrews 12, 12 and 1. Seeing we're compassed about with so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race which is set before us, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. When he started that list, he didn't start off with lay aside sin. He said lay aside every weight. So the weights weigh us down, and they open up doors for the adversary to come in. So they said they were going to deal with Samson subtly. So how were they going to do it? They saw that Samson's weakness was Philistine women. <laughs> so they would use that against him. They knew what his weakness was. Understand that the devil has such an advantage on, on us. I won't say you, I'll say us. He has such an advantage. What do I mean by the advantage? He's been here since the beginning. He's been watching us. He has had people, uh, uh, his imps assigned to us so that they could watch us. And when I'm saying us, I'm not talking about us individually. I'm talking about down through time. As I said earlier, you're not the first person your imp was assigned to. Mm. So he understands the nature of men and women. He understands the things that really get up under our skin. And since he's been with you since birth, he knows the things that you have experienced and how those things can affect you. 
So what did he do? He uses those things against you. That's why you have to be careful not to flirt with the sin that you were bound by. Look, if you were bound by alcohol, you don't need to go in bars. In fact, you don't even need to walk down the alcohol line in the store. <laughs> I'm not saying that you're going to be tempted to grab a bottle, but why even put yourself in that position? You follow me? Whatever the sin was that he had you bound with, you need to stay as far away from it as possible. Amen. And then let me say this too. Even when you shore up that particular uh, uh, weakness, you know what he does? He takes a circuitous route to get back here. He may start, say, okay, well, he doesn't drink anymore, but... Let's see if we can get him to go to social gatherings that are not with the church. Let's see if we can get him to go to gatherings where they're doing some drinking, even though he's not. You see what I'm saying? He'll take a circuitous route to get you back here. And before you realize it, there that sin is, staring you in the face. There the temptation is. Brother Philip, I'm strong. So was Samson. Okay, back to work. All right. They said they were going to get a Philistine woman, so enter Delilah. The 30 lords of the Philistines offered her 1,100 pieces of silver apiece if she could get him to reveal the source of his strength. As I've said, they could not get him with force, so they had to use subtlety, and they had enough sense to realize that these women were who were pulling Samson. They were drawing him. So if we can use one of them to get close enough to get the secret of his strength, we got it. So now let me say this about sin too. As I told you, it's not the, it's not the big things. What is that? Uh, Song of Solomon. Uh, I think it's where that is. Song of Solomon 2 and 15. What does it say? Go on to it. Mm-hmm. Song of Solomon 2 and 15. Mm -hmm. Take us the foxes, mm -hmm. the little foxes, that spoil the vines. Mm -hmm. For our vines have tender grapes. Mm -hmm. He said, it's the little foxes that spoil the vines. It's not the big ones. You know why? Because they used to put fencing around the grapes. So the big foxes couldn't get in there to eat the grapes. But the little foxes could squeeze through the little openings and they could get in there and they could eat all the grapes they wanted. What am I saying here? It's never the big sins that get you. It's the little bitty ones, the ones that you feel are no harm. It never starts off big. People don't backslide all at once. It's always little things. I've already stated he starts off with weights and then he moves up to little sins. So, Samson starts off with some small sins. Samson, talking with Delilah, when she asks him, she begin, he begins to tell lies to her. You see what I'm saying? People talk about white lies. No such mm -hmm. thing. There's no such thing as a white lie and a black lie. All lies are lies. Amen. The scripture gives note that all sin is equally sinful. All lies are equally lies. You say, oh, well, uh, uh, I was just stretching the truth. Newsflash, the truth cannot be stretched. It is what it is. You know, it does not change. You can embellish it, but guess what? That's still <laughs> lying. However you want to phrase it, however you want to put it, if it's not truth, then it's a lie. So you say, I was just joking, okay? If it wasn't the truth, that's all I'm saying. So he starts off by lying, first off. He says, first he says, bind me with seven green widths, which are uh, seven green widths, which are bowstrings that have not been dried out to be used on, arrow, on bows for arrows. He said, if you bind me with these, then I, I become weak as any man. Next, he tells her, bind me with new ropes that have not been used. 
okay? Now, each time he gets a little closer to the truth. Now, the wits, of course, were nowhere near the truth. Nowhere near the truth. But the next time when he talks about the ropes, these are things that are woven together. Okay? So he's getting closer. Lastly, he tells her to weave his hair, the seven locks of his hair, into a loom. And how the, this loom, once his hair is weaved into it, he'll become as weak as any other man. You see what I'm saying? Each time he got a little closer and a little closer. That's the way sin does you. You get a little closer and a little closer to going back and being bound again. We're still talking about Simon Samson's final victory. The thing about Samson is he was such a flawed judge, and you can see why, as we've been describing him here. In every case, she, okay, she would awaken Samson with the statement that the Philistines were upon him, and he would arise and do battle. Excuse me, he would arise to do battle in all of his strength. You see how silly he was? She kept doing this, and he would get up, shake himself, be ready to do battle, and nobody would be there. And I guess he would just laugh about it and then go back to sleep. He was so blinded by his own lust and arrogance that he could not even see the danger that was in the room with him. Yet he persisted. She kept pressing him, though, until finally he told his whole heart. And once he did, you know, just like his wife did the same thing to him, he learned nothing from his experiences. Twice a woman deceived him and betrayed him. The first time, all he lost was a bet. This next time, he lost his life. What I mean by his life, he lost his eyes. So he did not have the freedom to move about like he did before. And he lost his strength. As I said, the devil will always come at you with things that have worked on you in the past. Samson's wife getting the riddle answer worked on him. Delilah getting the answer to why his strength, where his strength lie, worked the same way. Because of this, Samson's eyes were put out. Now, let's get off into the lesson. Judges 16 and 21. But the Philistines took him, put out his eyes, and brought him down to God, the same place he had to haul it, and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. The Philistines captured Samson easily after his strength was gone, and rather than kill him, they decided to put out his eyes, thus making it impossible for him to escape. He couldn't go anywhere. Even if Samson had his strength, what could he do? He couldn't see anybody. They could come at him with spears from all sides, and they could kill him. So Samson had no recourse but to be bound by the Philistines. But it wasn't really the Philistines that bound Samson. They didn't bind him. Samson's own pride, Samson's own arrogance, Samson's own lust were the things that binded him. That's the same things that bind us. The very same things. We allow our feelings. We allow our emotions. We allow our desires to bind us so that we cannot move freely anymore. Understand this. The adversary's ultimate goal is to damn your soul to hell. But now Christians, let me show you about his goal with you. If he can't get you to backslide and go back on God, he wants to make you an ineffectual Christian. Amen. He wants to make your testimony ineffectual. See, all he has to do is get you to fall once. That's all he has to do. After that, everybody who had heard your testimony prior to that, they're going to always remember what when you fell. You follow me? That's the thing. That's how the adversary works. He wants to make you ineffectual in your testimony for God. Samson could do nothing. He's a blind man. They bound him with brass feathers. You know, feathers, they had his arms up on him like this. 
And then what did they do? They put him on a grinding wheel. So we would have to push this millstone around and grind their food for them. Think about the shame. Number one, this job was a job that was for animals or for slaves. Now, in fact, women did it as well. And like I told y'all, like, hey, look, I'm not sexist. I'm just telling you what they did and how they felt. This was the most demeaning job they could give him. The former uh, uh, enemy who they all feared was now brought so low that all he could do was grind at the mill for their pleasure. He had to feed them. <laughs> Think about it. You burned our crops, now you're going to grind our food. You see? This is what happens when we allow pride and arrogance to come to the fore and to follow it rather than following God's word. They put in the work at the most demeaning job for a man of pride, grinding grain at the mill. Now, verse 22, you know, it makes a really big, big jump here. We don't hear anything else about Samson's life at the mill. We hear nothing except that he's grinding at the mill. His eyes have been put out. He's been made to be a menial servant and to serve the Philistines in a way that he would never have done. But verse 22, and let me say this too. God can change the situation in a moment, okay? And as I said always, God had a plan in place. Like I said, when we started this unit, I told you, talking about kings and leaders, God was preparing the people. As I said, Samson, basically, his blood correlated with the children of Israel, how they were. Now he's in bondage as they were. But verse 22 says, How be it, the hairs of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Okay. Now that, that, that's something that's very interesting. The hairs of his head began to grow. I don't know what the Philistines were thinking. Did they not think his hair was going to grow back? Did they think because they shaved him that he was going to be bald forever? Or did they think that cutting his hair would just be enough and his strength would never come back to him? He was no longer a threat. Now, all of those things sound like crazy ideas to me. Just on the surface. But like I said, God works under the surface. See, just like Samson was overconfident, the Philistines were as well. And I do believe that was God's plan. I do believe that was the workings of God. The Bible said the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So God can influence how anyone thinks. He can influence how the enemy thinks in order to bring about the victory that he had planned. Remember, the whole reason for Samson's birth was so that God could have occasion against the Philistines to deliver Israel, correction, to start delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. The Philistines were a threat and would always be a threat unless they were dealt with. God wanted them dealt with, but he needed a reason more than just potential danger. He needed them to attack Israel so that he could respond in the way he wanted to. Like I say, the little foxes just spoiled the vine. They didn't realize that while he was grinding and his hair was growing, a problem was arising. Overconfidence. All right. And when the people, excuse me, the Lord of the Philistine gathered them, verse 23, together to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their God, and to rejoice for they said, our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. Now, they're having a big celebration because they now have Samson. Now, 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 just looking at the wording and the way the scripture comes out, I don't really believe Samson ground mill for very long. I really don't. Because, you know, let's face it, when something great happens, let's say our child graduates from college or high school, we don't wait a year before we have a celebration, do we? 
That's something, a milestone that we want to uh, uh, celebrate as soon as possible. And trust me, Samson had been giving them the blues for a while. Remember, he ruled, he judged Israel for 20 years. Do you think in those 20 years, Samson was just sitting at the Rock of Eden? <laughs> no, he was causing problems. And they could do nothing about him. So what did they do? Once they finally got him, well, hold up. Let's think about, let's just go back to when they brought him down from the Rock of Eden. What did they do? They yelled, yeah, we got it. They were rejoicing right then. So you really think they waited a long time to rejoice now? No. South may not have grinded that mill more than a month, if that long. But they were going to have a great celebration because they felt like their God, Dagon, had delivered Samson into their hands. You know, it's amazing how, how the people of the ancient world thought. Their God had not been able to do anything with Samson for 20 years. <laughs> but now all of a sudden, Dagon had got stronger than the God of Israel. <laughs> it's amazing to me. But you know what? They're no different from the way we think. Look, I have two older brothers. And I missed out on a whole lot of things that I could have done watching my two older brothers. Because God gave me enough sense at an early age that if it didn't work for them, it was not going to work for me. When we're dealing with our parents, if it didn't work for them, it was not going to work for me. So there was no sense in me traveling down that road. But you know what? You know what many of us do? We will see somebody fail and we will skip right down that road. Why? It doesn't even make sense. Do you really think you're smarter than everyone else? Do you really think that you can do something that other people were not able to do? Mm. No. You know what that is? Pride. And you know who's fueling that pride? The devil. <laughs> Why? So you can make shipwreck. Mm. You know, I've always taught my children, you have to see the hand of the enemy in the things that are happening in your life, especially in the people that you're dealing with. You know, we, we spend our time, uh, correction, we waste our time looking at people and looking at people's actions. Well, we need to look behind the individual and see who's pulling the strings. Why is that important? Because you need to see what the end game is. What is the devil trying to use them to do to you. And I'm not talking about the, uh, the discomfort they bring you, but it's not, because it's not really about what they do to you, okay? It's about how you react to what they do to you. You follow me? That's the thing. What's, why is he pulling the strings this way? What is he trying to get me to do through their actions? That's what you need to look at. Quit looking at the individual and see the hands of the enemy behind the scenes. And I've always taught my children, you never give the devil what he wants. If I have to take a loss, I'll take a loss, but I will not give the devil what he wants. I will just let it fly. You know, the old song where I used to say, sometimes you got to give up the right for the wrong. That's what you do. But they had a big celebration and they were going to praise Dagon for delivering Samson into their hand. I, I haven't seen, you know, as far as I know, Dagon hadn't done anything. In fact, later on, it, it, when we get off into some other lessons, we're going to find where the Ark of God went to Dagon's temple and Dagon fell flat on his face <laughs> mm -hmm. before the Ark of God. They set him back up. They came back in the next morning. Guess what? Not only had Dagon fallen flat on his face, but he was decapitated and he lost both hands because no God can stand up to our God. Thank you, Amen. Lord. Let me finish. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, call for Samson that he may, that he may make a sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house and he made them sport. And they set him between the pillars. They brought Samson out and they made sport of him. They made him into a court jester. Look at this mighty man, this man who was once anointed, who had so much potential that he could have done anything. But what happened? 
He allowed that potential to languish because he used his gifts for himself and not for his God. Some of us are doing the same thing. Understand this. God gave you the gift. You give it back to him. Let him show you how to use it. And guess what? Everybody benefits. Let me hurry on. So they made sport of him down there. I don't know how they did it. The Bible doesn't give us any information. But it just said they brought him out and they made, they made, him, made him make sport for them. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may fill the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I might lean on them. Samson had a plan in place. He realized that, you know, he was going to get his chance. So y'all brought me out here. And he knew that the uh, house, the way it was constructed, had pillars that it stood upon. So he told the lad that was leading him by the hand, let me lean on the pillars like he was tired. Now, over 3,000 people were on the roof alone, not to mention all who had gathered below. But while they were celebrating, God was preparing their destruction. Now, the house was full of men and women, and the lords of the Philistine were there. And there were upon the roof, as I just said, about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. So they were all sitting there. They were Basically, they were sitting ducks. <laughs> and Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Now, as I said earlier, when he had uh, killed a thousand Philistines, um, I commend Samson for remembering that he was God's servant. I will commend him for that now. He remembered that he was God's servant. He realized that he had squandered his abilities and his opportunities. But Samson still was acting like a petulant child because he wanted to be avenged for his two eyes. He still had vengeance on his mind. But since it fit in with God's plan, God probably just said, okay. <laughs> and Samson took hold, verse 29, the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left. And Samson said, verse 30, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than which he slew in his life. Now, the way this house was constructed, it doesn't give us any details. Because I, I've been trying to picture it in my mind. Uh, these pillars and how people were on the roof. Now, now, understand this, though. There were more than just the people on the roof. They just talked about people on the roof. But there were more people in this uh, uh, stadium, we'll call it, than the people that were on the roof. So we know at least 3,000 people died. But guess what? There were people in, this, in, this, in the, in the uh, stadium with him, on the floor of the stadium with him also. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that there was a lower deck because the higher deck is always going to be for those people of privilege. And the lower decks are going to be for the more common people. So there were a lot of people in this site. But Samson said, let me die with my enemies. Now, like I said, I want to commend him for that. He was not trying to, to get, escape his fate. He realized he had squandered his ability. He realized he had squandered his power. He realized that he had not acted in the way of a Nazarite. He was supposed to be consecrated unto God, and he did not do it. But he understood that God was sovereign. He said, let me die with my enemies, Father. Just let me die. And when he pushed those pillars apart, the house fell in and he killed all those Philistine lords. And he set the Philistines back a while because you don't hear too much about the Philistines attack until the time of Eli. That's when you hear about them. So by killing off all the lords of the Philistines, they had to regroup. So God had started the process of getting rid of the Philistines. You know, if, if you look down through history, you can't find anybody who's a Philistine anymore. They just completely disappeared off the scene. You know, I'm looking up who were their descendants. They really can't tell you. <laughs> so, 
In the end, Samson killed more people in the death than in his life and set the Philistines back for years by killing off all their leaders. Now, verse 31. Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the burying place of Manoah, his father. And he judged Israel 20 years. He received a hero's burial. And you know he killed a lot of people. You know why I can say that? Because Israelites were able to just come in and get his body. Do you really think the Philistines would have just let them walk in and take his body? No. They were able to walk in, dig, had enough time to dig through the rubble to find the corpse of Samson, to take it back and give it a hero's burial. But the Philistines were set back because of this one act. This one man army was able to start the process, which is what God intended. Samson's final victory over the Philistines was the beginning of the end for the Philistines. Now, for those of you who uh, have been uh, with us and who may not have our book, now we have the Union Gospel Press Sunday School book. That's what we use for our lessons. Now, for those of you who may not have the book, I, I want to give you the uh, lesson text for our next lesson which will be called Samuel's leadership, uh, Samuel's leadership Brings Victory. And our scriptures are found in 1 Samuel, the seventh chapter, the first through the 12th verse. So that's for next week. But for this week, we see the end of Samson. We see the life of Samson. I've always been told that Experience is the best teacher, okay? And it is. But nowhere in that statement does it say it has to be your experience. If we can learn from someone else's experiences, then we're that much farther ahead in the game. Learn from Samson's experience. Arrogance and pride lead to destruction. Revenge is always bitter in the end. God bless you. We'll see you next week.